Well, it's good, good to see all you visitors here today, um, and good to see those of you who have been attending. Um, as you know, this is, uh, if you don't know me, my name is Robbie, uh, and this is my teaching tool, and I use this up here for pictures as well, uh, so we can get a better understanding, you know, of uh, the visual side of it. Um, we've been doing this for about a year, a year and a half or so, just like this. We used to do it in the classroom, but we moved in here, and obviously we got a bigger crowd, and we would not be able to do it in that classroom. It would be really cramped, but um, like the pastor said, this is my last Sunday morning, tentatively, um, of doing this uh, Sunday, Sunday school service, and while I was doing my studies this week, I realized that um, God led me to do a study on the glory and the majesty of God. Um, we've been talking about the social gospel, you know, we've been talking about things like that that we're going to do in the future, but I think to end it on a good note... Um, and to have us leave here uh, with a, a mind knowing how great God is, um, I think this was uh, the right thing to do. And the way I'm going to do that, first of all, is I'm going to, and you'll see me pointing here, here and there, but the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to use secular science numbers. So we can talk about Christian science, we can talk about how you know we put things in our perspective, but I'm actually going to use their numbers and their calculations and their tools to prove how great God is. So, but first of all, I want to, um, I think it's important, and I haven't done this in the past, but to give honor to those people that um, have actually helped me in my ministry, I, I guess you could say. I want to name them by name. If you don't know them, Charles Lawson, Paul Washer, anybody know Paul Washer? Charles Lawson. Um, there's a, a man named Works. He's from the Ghetto Gospel Ministry. Um, all these men have helped me kind of guide my ministry to what it is. So I want to give honor to them. I think it's important that we honor God first for giving men the knowledge and the understanding in the Word of God, and we honor them as well. So let's get started. Let's turn to Philippians 2.12. question first, and in my studies, for the visitors here, uh, I don't like to generalize things. I like to make things very specific to you. I like to ask you direct questions. So I want to ask you this direct question, and this has to do with the glory of God. I just want you to look at Philippians 2, the end of verse 12, the last sentence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I want to ask you personally, do you fear God and do you tremble when you hear of God? When you hear the Lord Jesus Christ, does it make you tremble? And is that how you worship? Because that is a very important thing that we are lacking today in the Christian church. All right? Psalms 14.1 the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. The fool. These scientists out here who have these, you know, uh, I guess you can call them ministries as well, because they're teaching people to look away from the Bible. So they have these ministries that tell people there is no God. And the Bible says that they're fools. And the Bible also says, Paul says that for those who don't believe in God, in Hebrews, I'm sorry, um, 2 Corinthians, that the God of this world has blinded their eyes to the gospel. So these men, as they're teaching people in the schools and the evolution and all these things that they're teaching people, they are teaching people to go way away from God. And even in psychology and all these different sciences, the God of this world has blinded their eyes. And so it's important that we understand that this is what we look at. This is what we look at for knowledge and wisdom and not them. But I'm going to use their numbers to prove that God is glorious. So, this right here is the material world, right? This is what we see every day. Um, 
But we don't, a lot of times we don't recognize what the material world is made up of. This is what it's made up of. The atomic world, so-called, all right? Science, so-called. I've never seen an atom. Has anybody ever seen an atom? I've never seen one, but science says there is atoms. Protons and neutrons, electrons, things like that. What makes this up is a subatomic world. Einstein said that a photon, who's ever heard of a photon? Photon is light, right? It's the little particles that make up light. And these little particles of light are baffling people, baffling science and baffling physics. Why? Because they say that this is not only a tangible particle, but it's a wave as well. It morphs into whatever it needs to be to emit light. And it's very interesting to think of that the bottom, the very subatomic world that everything is, it's like pixels on a TV screen. When you see, you know, the, when you see this, pixels make this up. It's just like the material world, right? The subatomic particles make up this world. And it's amazing how it all begins with light. It's, it's pretty amazing. So, science justifying that uh, they, they use their own justification, talking about evolution and how, you know, the Big Bang Theory and how everything came about. The universe. Now, we're about to get into some numbers here in a minute. But, David said, Psalm 139, 14, he said, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, when you think about that, you say, fearfully and wonderfully made. And I don't think anything David said was an understatement. But, wow, those are two really, really big words that you're about to see. When you put these words together, these are, they should be like really capitalized in the, in the word of God. I mean, fearfully and wonderfully made. So, let's talk about mathematics right quick. In math, and I'm about to, I'm about to give you a few quotes here. Give you some quotes. Roger Penrose came up with this calculation. 10 to the 50th power. In mathematics, 10 to the 50th power, that's one with 50 zeros at the end of it, is a mathematical impossibility. I want you to just keep that number in your mind. It's a, it's a mathematical impossibility. Science says that there is 10 to the 82nd power atoms in the universe. So, that lets you know right now, or right there, that the atoms in the universe is a mathematical impossibility. That there are that many atoms in the universe. One with 82 zeros behind it. He also said that for the universe to come into existence on its own, just by itself, is 10 to the 123rd power. The 123rd power, that's one with 123 zeros. And I was actually going to write the numbers up here, but it would have took me forever. But, so this lets you know, he actually makes a quote. He says, even if you were to put a zero on every particle in the universe, it still wouldn't be enough. You see that? 10 to the 123rd power to one that the universe came into existence on its own. Now, there's an astrophysicist named Eric Zakrinsen. He's from Sweden. He's from Sweden. He did a, co a computer simulated model, and these are his numbers. All right. He says that there are 700 quintillion planets in the universe. There's our home there. There's the Milky Way, or you know. He says there are 700 quintillion, that's seven with 20 zeros behind it, planets in the universe. He says that there are 100 billion galaxies. 100 billion. 
That's one with 18 zeros behind it. Um, he says there are 50 billion planets in the Milky Way alone. Just in our solar system, there's 50 million. And so this is what he did. He put in a computer-generated model with 700 quintillion planets, 100 billion galaxies, over, and he wanted to test the evolution, you know, over this time of how the, the universe works and how these solar systems work and stars. And he did it over a 13.8 billion year model. And he says there is one Earth, just one, just one out of his model, an astrophysicist, out of 700 quintillion planets and 100 billion galaxies. There's only one Earth. Now, if there is 700 quintillion planets and 100 billion galaxies, I think it's a pretty amazing thing that we may be the only living human beings that God has created like he has. And I think that's pretty majestic in itself. Now, there's a lady here. Her name is, she's an astronomer, Sandra Faber. She tests the weight of a neutron. Now, this number right here, 1.00137841870, is the times a neutron is heavier than a proton. Now, that's a pretty small number, you know. She says that the helium-hydrogen mixture in a neutron and in a proton, if one of these numbers, if I was to go like this, we wouldn't exist. Just one. We wouldn't exist. Do you call that precision? I call that precision. That's precision. She said the helium and hydro, the, they would, helium, the hydrogen would be mixed, the mixture would be too lean, and it would create a catastrophe, and none of us would exist. Just one number. The density, I don't know if you guys know who Stephen Hawking is. Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking, this is not his number, but he talks about, he actually makes an illustration, and he says that if every system or law or theory was set up on dials, and it was laid across a man who was sitting at a desk, and there was, you know, 100,000 dials here, and every one of them was set at a certain place, these dials. If one of those dials was moved 1%, nothing would exist. Zero. Nothing. This is also a pretty hefty thing. They claim, Big Bang Theory, uh, theorist, scientist, they claim that this number, 0.00000000001%, that was if the density at the beginning, when everything came into being, if the density had changed that number, this percent, nothing would exist. I mean, you don't get any more precise than that. That's precision. God is precise. God's word is precise. Right? Now, enough about the universe. Let's talk about... What is that? You might tell me what that is? Red blood cell. Red blood cell. Red blood cell. Now, remember this number. 10 to the 50th power is mathematically impossible. It's impossible. Science says that for a cell to come into existence, one cell, one cell to come into existence by itself is 10 to the 40,000th power to one. Each cell, you see. So you're talking about winning the lottery every single day for 10,000 years. Just every day. Just winning the lottery, 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 lottery. 10 to 40,000. How many times can you fit this number, 10 to the 50th power, into that number? Trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of times. That a cell would come into existence on its own. Now, we do on this earth have one cell of organisms. Right? And each one of these one cell organisms has millions of parts in each cell. Each one of them. 
every cell breakdown of what you get in science. But I'm going to read something for you in a minute that was going to blow that out of the water. The human cell, or any cell, is the most complex factory that the human race has ever seen. Millions of parts have to be working for a cell to exist. So not only is it 10 to the 40,000th power to one that it comes into existence, but now every single one of those million parts has to work for the living cell to, to be alive. Now think about this. If I'm standing right here, if I have no air to breathe, am I alive? No. If uh, the trees are not out there emitting oxygen and I'm not sucking that oxygen and putting out carbon dioxide to help them live, and that seed didn't grow and all the things that has to happen, symbiotic things that have to happen together to work together for me to even be alive, that's the same thing with the cell. Even though it, it's this mathematical impossibility and the lotteries of one coming to, into existence on their own is this much, but then all these things have to work, but then you have to have the symbiotic things working too for even that one cell to work. You see? Just layers and layers and layers and layers of things have to happen. Now I put New York City up here because New York City is a complex place, right? If I was to go in an air balloon or something like that or a plane and, and go you know, a couple hundred feet above New York City and look at the topography, look down on New York City, all the little pieces and parts functioning at 8, eight o'clock in the morning, whether it's you know, people delivering things or people cooking stuff or taking out the trash or whatever, cars going down the road, people walking to work, you know, all these little pieces and things working together to make New York City what it is doesn't even compare to what's going on in a human cell. Not even close. Not even close. Now I want you to get this now. When we talk about, let, let's, let's take a break and turn to uh, Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. <coughs> Hebrews 11. I don't know how fired up this gets you guys, but I'm telling you right now. The precision of God, the majesty of God, when you see these things and you see the subatomic world and you start studying that stuff, it is, it is it's something beyond our imagination. Hebrews 11, verse 3, through faith we understand that the, what, worlds, plural, worlds, were framed by the word of God. So that things which were seen, natural world, were not made of things that were, or were made of things that, that do, sorry, let me read that again. Were not made of things which do appear. Does an atom appear? Does subatomic particles appear? No, they don't. These things are, you're actually tapped, they can't even understand, physicists can't even understand what's going on in the subatomic world. They can't even understand it. They think they can measure it and things like that, but they're starting to realize there's some spiritual things going on in the, the deep material things of this world. Now, look at this measurement. Who's ever heard of a micrometer? Engine mechanics. I'm a diesel mechanic. I work on a little bit of it. A micrometer is very small. 10,000, 10, 10, all right, in measurement. Eight micrometer... I'm not even going to ask anybody if they understand, you know, how small that is, but it's very small. I'll tell you how small it is. It's ten times smaller in diameter than a human hair. Think about that. Pluck a hair out, see if you can test the diameter of a human hair, and then condense that ten times. That's the size of a cell. So With you you absolutely can't see it. You have to put it under a microscope, a deep microscope. And there's millions and millions and millions of parts in these cells. There's 200 different types of cells in your body. How many think they know how many cells are in the human body? Anybody? There are, this is, this is their count right now. 
37 trillion human cells. That's bone, skin, blood, red blood, things like this, white blood. Then there's bacteria cells, 70 trillion. Over 100 trillion cells in one human body with millions of parts that have to, every one of those have to work because they reproduce themselves, right? They just, this is, this is the way you look under a microscope and this is what cells do. They're just reproducing themselves, reconstructing themselves, right? So all those parts have to work in every single cell or it's dead. Trillions and trillions and trillions and millions and millions and millions, smaller than a human hair. They all have to work, and then everything around them has to work. Everything. For this to be. For you to breathe. For you to walk and see. <clears throat> now, it goes even further in, inside of a human cell. When we start talking about DNA. DNA? Everybody knows what that is? I didn't really, I mean, I've heard of DNA, but I've never seen the majesty of DNA until I started doing this study. There are, not every cell has DNA. Your red blood cells do not have DNA in them. But there are 37 trillion cells in your body that do have DNA. Now DNA, um, scientists are flabbergasted at DNA. But if you do your study into what they're doing now with DNA, it's scary. There's, there's this company called CRISPR, or it's this organization called CRISPR that they are they're able to manipulate your DNA, make, you know, um, designer babies and change the eyes and all these kind of things. They're able to go in and do these things, which is very scary. But DNA, you have 20,000 genes in your body. 20,000 genes. We know what chromosomes, we've heard of chromosomes in high school or college, whatever the case may be, but it's a confusing thing. You know, you have the X the X chromosome and the Y chromosome, right? The male and the female. But they don't really go into detail about the chromosomes. Let's just take, for instance, this X chromosome. It actually looks like this. That's what the chromosome looks like. All this is made up of DNA. And this is the way it works. I'm gonna draw a little, <coughs> see if I can do my best at this. DNA, I mean, I can do that. There's DNA right there. So that's what it looks like. And if, remember the diameter of a cell. If you were to take the DNA in each one of the cells, take the DNA that's stored inside this little bitty, tiny, microscopic thing. If you were to take it and unroll it, it's almost two yards long. That's how much it's stuffed in there. DNA is the software. It's literally the digital software that makes up what you are as a human being, you know? Makes you up. It, it, it's your life code, that's what they say. And I'll show you a little bit here in a minute. But this is the way it works. So all these little strands of DNA are wrapped around little proteins like that. And then... After they're wrapped around these proteins, then they go like this. And so, every little protein right there. DNA makes up over 100,000 proteins. 100,000 proteins in one strand of DNA. And so when you look at an X chromosome, it looks like this. Just bunches and bunches and bunches and bunches, just like that, of DNA. And all that software and all that code to make up who you are. All right? It makes 20 amino acids. If you know anything about, you know, fitness or anything like that, amino acids are very important. So, now I want you to think about this. This is the number 10 to the 48th power, 10, one with 48 zeros behind it, that one DNA strand will come into existence by itself. Just one. So, Lotto number after lotto after lotto after lotto after lotto after lotto after lotto of one DNA strand in 37 trillion cells 
working all together with all the million parts to make up what you are and make up everything in this physical world with all the symbiotic things that have to go along with it. Who knows how much of the human body you have zero control of. Us as human beings, 97% of your body functions by itself. Who knew that? We don't even talk about the brain. We don't talk about the conscience, what's going on up here, what's going on in the heart. We don't even talk about that. I mean, I can lay out four or five more boards on this stuff. It's literally mind-boggling that a man of science who can sit here and make up this number, one to the 123rd power, zeros as far as you can see, and say that there is no God. It's amazing that somebody can look at a human cell and know that they've said that 10 to the 40,000th power that one will come into existence by itself. They can put that number out there but then say there's no God. The fool has said in his heart there is no God. Amen. Right? I mean, you have to be a fool just to show, to, for me to show you this little small portion of physics and science by their numbers and say, this is not intelligently done. It's amazing. It's amazing. Now this right here, and we were going to do a study on this, but we're going to hold off on it. This right here is one portion of your human genome. Human genome is... If you're looking at DNA, let me go back. You see these little, these two little rods coming in? Each one of those circles right there have four rods that are split into two, and each one of those has a letter, A, G, C, T. They all have, they're all different chemicals that make those up. And what they've done is they've mapped out the human <coughs> genome, so they've taken the DNA of a whole human body. They've taken it out, take all the DNA out, and they've mapped it out. And if you were to look at like a schematic, for any mechanics or electricians in here, if you were looking at a schematic, it's insane, the schematic that goes along with all the, the DNA particles and all the things that go. But, this is the genome. Now I want you to listen to this, about the human genome. Oh, I got to memorize it. Here we go. The human genome is considered the book of human life. So the DNA, this is the code, the digital code. So if you were to look at yourself as a computer, right? Jonathan studies computers. He knows all about code. For one icon on a desktop of a computer, it takes lines and lines and lines and lines of code. What happens if one letter or one line is messed up? Uh, if you do like a hash check, it's not the same image. Not even the same image, one hash check. Not even the same image. For one icon that's on a computer. So think about this. Line after line after line after line after line of DNA code that's in your body makes up what you are. And one letter can be off of your human genome and you can have scoliosis. One. One little G can be a C and you have a disease. You see? Now, I'm going to tell you what I believe about it. You want to talk about all these people nowadays, they are trying to create eternal life. They are trying to go in and change DNA. They are trying to use artificial intelligence to create all this stuff to create eternal life. You know what I think? I think if one G is messed up and it was a C, God meant it to be that way. It's like the blind man that Jesus went up to and the disciples said, who hath sinned that this man is blind? Was it him? Which, I don't know why they asked that question because he couldn't sin before he was born, right? But he said, was it him that sinned or his mother and father who sinned that this man is blind? He said, neither one of them have sinned. This man is blind for this very moment that it may show the works of God and the glory of God, me here, to make his eyes open. You see? One letter. Now watch this. One human genome, all the DNA put together for a human, makes up 3.2 billion letters. 3.2 billion letters. 
that would fill up 1,000 books, 500 pages each book with the smallest, tiniest lettering on each page. I mean, how tall is that? <laughs> right? If you was to put them all just, that's one human body. Just one. There's no accidents. Now think about all those systems that are made up of trillions and trillions and trillions of cells with millions and millions and millions of parts that all have to be working together to make up one kidney. And if you don't have a kidney, well, you can live without one kidney, but if you don't have both kidneys, you don't live. If you don't, your liver ain't working right, you're done. Right? And think about, as we're walking in this physical world, now when we go, we understand that everything that we see in this physical world is made up of that. Simple little microscopic things we can't even see made up of light, pixelated into the atomic world that makes up the physical world, and it makes up us, these little particles and these little cells and and I want to go around, people want to go around saying I'm a god. They're a fool. They're a fool. Let me read this and then we can be done. Michael Denton, biochemist. An evolutionary biochemist. This is what he says. To grasp, well this is in his book, the theory, A Theory in Crisis. He's talking about the evolutionary theory. 1985, he says, to grasp the reality of life as it has been revealed by the molecular biology, we must magnify a cell th a thousand million times until it is 12 miles in diameter and resembles a giant airship large enough to cover a great city like London. So I want you to imagine this. We take this little microscopic thing right here, this cell, and we blow it up to where it's 12 miles long, 12 miles in diameter, and we're able to walk through it. This is what he's saying. What we would then see would be an object of unparalleled complexity and adaptive design. On the surface of the cell, we would see millions of openings, like the portholes of a vast spaceship, opening and closing to allow a continual stream of materials to flow in and out. If we were to enter one of these openings, we would find ourselves in a world of supreme technology and bewildering complexity. I heard a scientist say one time that a Boeing 757 is made up of hundreds of thousands of parts. Hundreds of thousands of parts. And he said that all the technologies that we have created... Every single technology that we have created from the radio up until the, the Boeing 757, all these big, huge technologies that we've got today, if you were to put every single one of them together and combine them all together, it would still not even be close to the technology that's in a human cell. One baby, ten, ten size smaller than a diameter of human hair cell. Now, we would see an endless, highly organized, we would see endless, highly, highly organized corridors and conduits branching in every direction away from the perimeter of the cell, some leading to a central memory bank of nucleus and others to assemble plants and uh, uh, assembly plants and processing units. The nucleus itself would be a vast spherical chamber, more than a kilometer in diameter resembling a dome inside of which we would see, all neatly stacked together in an orderly array, miles of coil chains of DNA molecules. A huge range of products and raw materials would be shuttling along the manifold conduits in a highly ordered fashion to and from all the various assembled plants and in the outer regions of the cell. We would wonder at the level of control Implicit in the movement of so many objects down so many seemingly endless corridors, all in perfect unison. We would see all around us in every direction we looked, all sorts of robot-like machines. 
we would notice that the simplest of the functional components of the cells, the protein molecules, were astonishingly complex pieces of molecular machinery, each one consisting of 3,000 atoms arranged in highly organized 3D spatial conformation. I mean, I can keep going. Let me just read the paragraph, the last paragraph. Let me remind you again that we are, what we are talking about, a living cell, is a microscopic dot and thousands of these entire factories, including all the complexity that we discussed above, could fit on the head of a pin. Or going another way, let's add to this model of 20 square kilometer of breathtaking complexity, another 100 trillion equally complex factories, all working in perfect synchronicity, coordination with each other which would be a model of the 100 trillion cell human body, your body, that thing that we lug around every day and complain about, every part of which would contain pumps and coils and conduits and memory banks and processing centers, all working in perfect harmony with each other, all engineered to an unimaginable level of precision and all there to deliver to us our ability to be conscious, to see, to hear, to smell, to taste, to experience the world as we are so used to experiencing it that we have taken it and the, fascinate, and the uh, fantastic mechanics that make it possible for granted. One other thing. If you were to take, I'm going to say, to scale, this is the head of an aspirin. Everybody knows the size of an aspirin. If you were to take every single human being on earth, seven billion people, take all their DNA, put it together, it would fit on the head of an aspirin. Everybody. Can you leave here, even though I'm not very articulate and I'm as country as can be, and so most of y'all can't understand what I'm saying. <laughs> but if you can leave here, seeing this, and not go home and get on your face and say, thank you, Lord, for one cell, for one cell that came into existence and the trillions of cells that make me up and all the molecular things that make me up that I'm able to walk in this world and see what I see and hear what I see and taste what I, you know. There's no way that you can do that. And if you can, you're a fool. Let's pray. Our Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for allowing us to come here and basically, Lord, you have debunked every scientific person out there who says that you don't exist by their own numbers. Lord, you are worthy of all glory, majesty, power, dominion. There is none greater than you. You are the one true living God. And I'm so thankful that you've given us the opportunity to come here and learn something out of your word, learn something out of this world that is completely out of this world. You are majestic. You are worthy of all praise, and I, praise this, I pray as we leave here, Lord, that you would touch our hearts with this, that we would go out now, look at this physical world, and see the majesty that you have injected into this world that you have created. And I pray that, we would, that you would also put in our hearts to go out and preach that to people. To preach the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and let them know the majesty of God. I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.